Anna, and good morning, everybody. Thank you to the organisers for giving me the opportunity to talk to you all today. And um, you're quite right. I'm going to also talk to you about this paper um, that came out a couple of weeks ago. So we'll have a quick run through non-specific effects in general. This is a huge topic, very difficult to cover in the amount of time I've given, but I'm going to give you at least a flavour. Um, I mentioned a lot of papers, and they'll be in the handout, so you can go and look at uh, the details in those. So you, I will go through them quite fast. So I come from Australia in the bottom right-hand part of the world. Um, this map is distorted by the 130 million births that occur each year worldwide. So you can see Australia becomes a shrimp, very small, and you can see where all those births are. And the vast majority, 120 million of those, occur in areas of the world where there is still endemic TB. And all of those uh, babies born in those areas get BCG at birth. And so this is the most wide, one of the most widely used vaccines. Well, in fact, probably after COVID vaccines, maybe not, but it's one of the most widely used vaccines. So um, I love this vaccine. And one of the reasons I talk about it all the time is, as you see from Wikipedia, the vaccine was invented by Professor Nigel Curtis when he was a medical student. Now, you're welcome to use this slide to teach your children not to use Wikipedia. Um, although my talk does come from Wikipedia. But I've used this talk a lot, and I've used this, so I've used this slide a lot, and people have begun to believe it. They forget it's a joke, right? And so if you follow on Instagram, you follow tuberculosis BCG vaccine, you can see, so please, the Professor Nigel Curtis invented BCG, hashtag genius. So hashtag fake news, of course. Now, this vaccine was, of course, created by Calmet and uh, Gura, and it was created by passage Mycobacterium bovis, so TB from cattle. And um, they knew that if you passaged that bacteria, they lost their virulence. So they did this 230 times and 231 times over 13 years. And then they, it became avirulent. It was still antigenic, but it was no longer causing disease in animals. And after they showed it was effective in preventing TB in children, they sent this vaccine all over the world. And so we have BCG Denmark, BCG Russia, BCG Japan. And because these vaccine um, bacteria were continued to be cultured in each country for many years before they made vaccine lyophilization, the vaccine mutated and there were lots of genetic changes. And we now know that these different BCGs uh, have diff they all miss one bit of uh, one bit of gene, which is called RD1, the region of difference one. And that is why they all can no longer cause disease but they have multiple other differences in their genome. And so they're, these, they're, we say BCG vaccine, but there is many different types of, many different strains of BCG vaccine. And I haven't got time to go into today, but you just need to know they're different. We have shown in our um, trials that they invoke a different immune response. Uh, but the real question is, does that matter clinically? Does it change protection? And that's something we might be able to talk about later, but there are multiple different BCG strains. Now, the non-specific effects of BCG, I became interested in this area when I saw this fantastic study, which essentially showed that over the first six months of life, uh, the survival of babies who had had BCG Denmark um, at birth or, B or no BCG, and the babies that had BCG had better survival. But that survival is not because of protection against tuberculosis, but protection against the infections that kill um, infants in high mortality countries in the first six months of life. So that would be sepsis and respiratory infections, etc. And so we now understand that, that many vaccines, and I'm using BCG as one example, has effects against the target pathogens, which you call um, specific effects. Uh, so in this case, tuberculosis. And we also have effects um, which are called non-specific effects or off-target, sometimes called heterogeneous or an accidental advantage of this vaccine. And these um, are off-target effects against other infections, also against allergic diseases, autoimmune diseases, and malignancy. And um, the overall effect of a vaccine is therefore the sum of these effects, the specific and the off-target effects. So I prefer the phrase target and off-target. And the, this very early paper from um, the 1930s by Professor Calmet himself um, on the right, he was the boss of the team. Um, that's probably why it's BCG and not BGC, right? And um, he, in this paper that he describes that there is an effect on diminishing tuberculosis, but also diminishing general mortality. And this is shown in a nice review from the same time period that protection against the vaccine 
sorry, protection from the vaccine against tuberculosis. You can see their big reduction from um, 15.9 to 3.4, but also affect over and above this on general mortality or all cause mortality. And so these two effects are well known for um, BCG and a number of other vaccines, a number, number of other live vaccines. Now, off target effects should not be confused with indirect, uh, sorry, with cross protective effects. So we also know that this is a BCG is a very important vaccine to protect against leprosy, particularly in Africa. And this is because Mycobacterium leprae is related to Mycobacterium bovis. And so these are um, cross protective effects. And we wrote this review showing that it's not just leprosy, but also um, Mycobacterium ava intracellulari, so probably reducing cervical lymphadenitis, and also importantly, Mycobacterium ulcerans, the cause of Beruli ulcer. So these are cross protective, not off target effects. And of course, vaccines also have downstream effects, which are also different. So, for example, we know that if you give influenza vaccine, you protect against bacterial pneumonia. And if you give varicella vaccine, chickenpox vaccine, you review, you reduce invasive group A strep, strep disease. And similarly, rotavirus vaccine reduces febrile seizures and possibly type 1 diabetes. And these are kind of downstream effects. And finally, there are, of course, adverse effects, like, for example, the suggestion that H1N1 vaccines caused a narcolepsy. But we're talking here today about off-target effects, non-specific effects. Now, this is a very controversial topic. So these non-specific effects, hands up here if you believe in the non-specific effects of vaccines. And hands up if you don't believe in them or you're skeptical. OK, so um, people say they're for or against or they're a believer or a non-believer or skeptic or a non-skeptic. And this creates debate and disagreement and polarized view. If you hear someone who disagrees, it makes you stronger in your view. And this leads to conf- confirmation refutation bias and to confusion and hot air and high blood pressure and uncertainty and Anything like uncertainty is a threat to immunization programs. So it's important that we understand these effects. And confirmation, and I would wish I could come back next year and give a half hour talk about confirmation and refutation bias, because we are all subject to this more than we realize. And there's a beautiful paper here, which um, I don't understand it, but I just love the diagram, that basically confirms that we read the newspapers that agree with our views and we kind of shun the papers that we don't like. We watch the news that we like and we don't watch Fox News, for example. Um, so where do I sit on this? Well, it's summarized here. I think the non-specific effects of vaccines are plausible and they're potentially important, but we don't understand yet the clinical implications of all of them. And we wrote a review here, which explains a bit more in more detail in your handout that you can look at later. So the hypothesis or some of the principles that have been proposed are that um, particularly in high mortality countries where you can see these effects better, Live vaccines in particular, so BCG, measles-containing vaccines, and oral polio vaccines, um, reduce all-cause mortality, so more than just the effects on their target disease. So I've already um, shown you this um, study, but there are many other trials. And you need to know about this paper published by Higgins, a systematic review commissioned by the World Health Organization, published in 2016. And the conclusion was that evidence suggests that the receipt of BCG and measles containing vaccines reduces overall mortality by more than would be expected through their effects on the diseases they prevent. That's a summary of what I've already told you. But so let's look at the data. So this is the forest plots of the various trials that have looked at the effect of BCG, this table is. Uh, There are many observational studies, but we don't like those because they're subject to more bias. We only like trials, randomized controlled trials. Let's look at these. On the left is lower mortality with BCG. On the right, higher mortality. And if we look at those with a low risk of bias, um, there is a strong effect. In fact, there's about a 50% reduction in all-cause mortality in infants in multiple trials. And since this review, there have been more studies, another typical one here showing um, this is the mortality is reduced in the infants that were randomized, low birth weight babies in Guinea-Bissau that were randomized to BCG. And you can see here very nicely, again, the um, the reductions at 0.57 to a 43% reduction, and very nicely the control there of non-infectious conditions, um, no, not significantly different between the two groups. 
Now, not every study has shown the same thing, and this is one of the problems. So here's the other side of the coin. Here is a very nice study um, published a few years back in two pediatric intensive care units in India where babies were randomized to BCG. And in both units, both of those trials, very similar, there was no difference um, in mortality in those babies with BCG. And there was a very nice commentary, and I say very nice because I'm biased. This is confirmation bias. And this, this um, commentary made the point that this was a very good study. There was really very little you could fault, including the outcome measure, which was death. That's pretty unambiguous. But the important thing to understand in this study is that it used BCG Russia, whereas all the previous studies had used BCG Denmark. And I've explained to you that there are differences between these strains. And I can tell you that very shortly there's going to be the publication of this trial has been repeated identically, but now using BCG Denmark to try and understand whether the reason there was no effect, was it the strain or was it the setting or was there something different about the, um, the causes of mortality in the setting? So watch, this is coming out shortly. So I've told you that BCG is a great example, reduces all-cause mortality. There are many studies in animals from, from the 1940s reviewed in this paper by um, Bridget Frain, coming up, I hope. Um, you can look here, but more recently, the most recent one, very nice study from Canada, Eva Kaufman's group, that showed that BCG in this experimental model in hamsters and mice can, can protect against experimental infection with influenza A virus, that's IAV. Very, you just give the, the animals that get the BCG are protected and those that don't die in these models. What about humans? Well, there are a number of studies, I can't go through them all, that show protection against respiratory and other infections. And a very nice study here from Uganda, very recently by Sarah Prentice, again showing reduced in doctor-diagnosed infections in the babies who were randomized at birth to get BCG Denmark, 30% reduction. But again, not every study shows this. Here's a study from um, Denmark showing no reduction in infections in babies randomized to BCG. And the question is, why is this? Is it because it's um, a different setting or there are other reasons? I think it's, I mean, I, to give you a clue what I think, I think it's very likely to be big differences in the course of um, infections in these two countries and the burden of infection. Um, and there's a one study, at least, that suggests a reduction in uh, malaria in those babies that get BCG. We use BCG as a, the treatment of choice for bladder cancer because of its immunomodulatory effects. And there are many other studies showing effects on different malignancies and finally effects on allergies and autoimmune disease. And in our study in Melbourne, where we randomized babies to BCG or not, we showed that there was a 12% reduction in eczema at one year of age, and even higher, 25%, if you just took the subset of infants who had a family history of A to P. So lots of different effects. And the question, of course, is how does BCG do this? We know it's a very strong immunomodulator. And the current, um, at least one very strong, important contributing mechanism is trained immunity. And I'm really hoping I'm going to drop a hint maybe to the front row because they're the cleverest and um, to ask me a question. If I've got any more, perhaps I've got another slide about this later. So um, why does it rape? So why is this fantastic accidental advantage, this benefit? Why does this cause high blood pressure? Well, the reason is that the other side of this theory or the additional point is that non-live vaccines, such as inactivated polio vaccine and T DTP, may, and the important word there is may, increase all-cause mortality. So if we go back to the same paper that I told you before, the systematic review commissioned by the WHO, here it says that receipt of DTP may be associated with an increase in all-cause mortality. So let's look at the forest plot. Well, the first thing you notice is they are all observational trials, studies, I should say, because you can't do a randomized trial ethically of withholding DTP. So these are all observational studies. And this is the problem because it's very difficult to, you know, observational studies, people are always worried about bias. Sim very similar plot. And you can see here that if you look at the kind of bottom line, the increase in mortality here of potentially 38%, but look at those 95% confidence intervals. They're wide and they cross one. So this is not statistically significant. Now, this paper is published and there it is. It says that it's not significant and therefore there's no problem. But you have to read, this is the problem of the literature, you have to read the letters after, that come after this, because there was a mistake in this paper. And subsequently, there was a lot of correspondence and debate, and the authors issued 
um, an errata. They corrected this. And they actually, the correction is 1.53, so a 50% increase in mortality, which no longer crosses one. So if you were a hardcore statistician, you don't believe something. If it's on one side of one, you now have to believe it, right? But um, so this is very important to understand that there is evidence to suggest an increase in mortality, but you have to understand it's all observational trials. And I think the jury is still out. This um, paper came out subsequently, which looked, compared the studies with their risk of bias on the x-axis and how much increased mortality was seen. And you can see that the better studies with a lower risk of bias showed more increase in mortality, such that overall, if you just looked at the studies with the best the best studies with the lowest risk of bias, it was suggested that there was a, a, the, a twofold increase in all-cause mortality. So this is, of course, where the controversy lies. It is also suggested that the non-specific effects of vaccines last until another vaccine is given. So a non-live vaccine may negate the beneficial effects of a previously given live vaccine and vice versa. So um, to look at this, most babies um, around the world will get BCG at birth. And so their last vaccine was a live vaccine until they get their DTP doses. And then they've had the last vaccine is a non-live vaccine. And so you would expect they have better mortality for the first six weeks. And then after they get their non-live vaccines, that might be reversed until they get their next live vaccine, which is usually a measles containing vaccine around nine months. Now, if this were the case, you would be able to see this in a trial. And in fact, in this paper, in the Higgins paper, there is a beautiful table that illustrates this very nicely. And you can see these are all the all taken from the same trial. What happens after BCG, after DTP, after a measles containing vaccine? And you can see it's what you would expect from that, um, that hypothesis that there's reduced mortality to the left after BCG, increased after DTP, reduced after measles vaccine. And you see the pattern in all of these uh, trials, bar one, which is the one that was removed because there was a problem with it. And you also see this in other large epidemiological studies. For example, this from the USA showed that if your last vaccine was a live vaccine compared with a non-live vaccine, then your the hazard ratio for being admitted to hospital with a non-targeted infection was 50% lower. So this has been shown in, in many different kind of epidemiological studies. So Let's focus back on the off-target effects of my favorite vaccine, so BCG, the one I invented. And here is, um, here is the publication that I've kind of managed to squeeze in um, in the last five minutes, I'm pleased to say. So this paper was published two weeks ago um, and is a very large trial um, that we did, around, um, which I'll tell you about in a moment. Now, I don't want to trigger anybody, but if we go back to 2020, to April 2020, um, we were thinking we needed a COVID-19 vaccine desperately. It was the only way out of the pandemic. It was the only way out of the pandemic. And the timeline, if we went through the traditional phases of vaccine uh, development and testing and validation, uh, it was predicted that it would take to November 2033. That's 33, not 23, 33. But of course, we accelerated all of these phases. So the question was, could we use BCG, the beneficial effects of BCG, as a stopgap vaccine until we had COVID-19 vaccines? And so this was the trial that we did um, in five countries around the world. We randomized nearly 7,000 healthcare workers to either receive BCG vaccine or a saline placebo. And we followed those healthcare workers for 12 months. And we asked them whenever they got symptoms, um, could they keep a diary? And we had a custom filled a custom app on a smartphone. And for every day they had a symptom, they collected all of that information. In some parts of the world, we were able to telephone them every week and ask them what happened to get very accurate information. And of course, we also asked them to collect a respiratory swab. And sometimes it's amazing. Sometimes doctors aren't perfect. Who could believe this? And um, so sometimes they didn't do this. And we had to, we also checked their blood, of course. So we also collected um, questionnaires every three months to catch any missing data. And the primary outcome was defined to be at six months because we wanted to get an answer as fast as possible, of course. So the protocol is published, and you can look at that another time. And this was published um, just two weeks ago. And I need to make the point that I stand up and present the results, but there was a lot of people involved. And the BRACE trial consortium group is a very large number of people in 34 sites. And it's terrible to put over his name here, but I just want to acknowledge very strongly that there is a lot of people who did lots of hard work to make this trial um, work. 
So um, to quickly go through um, the consort diagram and to summarize that, we had to divide the trial into two stages. The first stage was in Australia, the worst place to do a trial of COVID-19 because we closed down, we stopped everybody coming. We had no COVID for the first year. Um, I believe it's because we do a trial. If you do a trial, the disease goes away always. This is a rule of trials. So we um, we prevented COVID-19 in Australia very effectively. And so we had to do the, the uh, look at phase two, where in, which is mostly outside Australia. So nearly 4,000 individuals randomized BCG, not BCG, in uh, intention to treat. But extraordinarily high to my thinking, 15% of our participants in their initial blood at randomization, they were already SARS-CoV-2 positive. And some of them were even had a positive swab at the recruitment center. So there was a time where there was lots of COVID. And so we did the analysis only in those people who had never been exposed to the virus in the modified intention to treat. Um, and we had a very large retention because we were very active follow-up. So 98% participate um, follow-up, which is extremely important in a COVID trial because you don't want to miss people who've, of course, died and can't fill in their um, the questionnaires. So these are the results. So what we found was that in the BCG group, there was 14.7% of the participants had an episode of COVID-19 um, during the six-month follow-up period versus 12.3% in the placebo group. And this is the same information in a Kaplan-Meier plot. And here's the difference between those. It was 2.4% difference, higher in the um, BCG group. But that difference of 2.4% was not statistically significant. Um, this is the same information, but this time plotted in a forest plot. So that's the same 2.4% increase in the BCG group with the 95% confident for crossing zero. And we had lots of predefined sensitivity and supplementary analyses, like what happens if we don't look at the first 14 days because it takes time for BCG to work? What happens if we only look at those people who had a PCR? And some of them, as you can see, um, are statistically significant because they have a larger follow-up period. And the larger follow-up period gives you a larger sample to kind of analyze when you're doing a time-to-event analysis. So all of these showed increase in the BCG group. And for severe COVID-19, the same thing. We found a slightly higher increase in the BCG group. Um, and so this was reported in the New England Journal of Medicine just two weeks ago that in this multi-site, double-blind, randomized controlled trial involving healthcare workers in five countries, Vaccination with BCG Denmark did not result in a lower risk of COVID-19 within six months than placebo. Now, that is completely true, but it is a massive oversimplification because, and I, this is very important for you to take home and to tell people, because um, the New England Journal are very strict about p-values, you know, like it's either yes or no. And I want to explain that there are some subtleties and caveats that um, are important to communicate. So, um the first one, the limitations are the definition of severe disease in our trial. Now, when we started a trial back in March of um, 2020, not much was known about COVID. We knew we saw all the horrible pictures from China and then Italy. It was all looking terrible. And we knew that you could become symptomatic. You could become very ill. Some people would be hospitalized. And obviously, sadly, some people would die. But we didn't know the proportions in that triangle. And I was quite worried that BCG might increase COVID because COVID is a lot of the symptoms of COVID are your immune response. What you're seeing when you get sick, when we all feel horrible is our immune response. So I was worried we would see more COVID exactly like this. But if you have a better immune response, that might be good because that might kill the virus faster and therefore less likely to go on and, and um, go through an inflammatory cascade. And you might be less likely to have severe disease. And if you have more symptomatic disease, but less people died, that would be very good. And so our hypothesis included that we might see more symptomatic disease. And we had long conversations about the ethics of whether it was OK to do this trial in the first place. So we thought this could happen. Now, what actually did happen? If you look at all of our participants together, what happened was this. We had um, 102 cases of COVID-19, but 136 severe cases. And luckily, I should say, only 10 hospitalizations and, and including one death. Now, there's obviously something wrong with the definition of severe COVID because you all know that severe COVID is not more than half of COVID cases, just from our own knowledge. And so it's very important to understand the definition. What we did was we knew that in amongst the severe COVID, not everybody would be hospitalized. And there was lots of discussion that maybe the hospitals would be full. And so if we used hospitalization as a criteria, 
it wouldn't be enough. And the threshold would be different in different countries. And this was different international trial. So we made a definition that if you were sick for three days, that was pretty sick. And we said, if you were either non-ambulant in bed for three days, that was quite sick. Or we also included a definition of could you work today if you were allowed? Obviously, you wouldn't be allowed, but if you were allowed, because there was also discussion at the beginning of the pandemic that maybe all healthcare workers would have to keep working even if they got sick or there would be no one to look after patients. So we had this definition, which turned out to be very bad because we now know that severe COVID is really all vaccine trials use hospitalization and sometimes only if you need oxygen or ventilation as severe COVID, whereas we had this definition that included the kind of COVID I had. I was sick for three days, but, you know, couldn't have gone to work, but it wasn't severe. And so I was in this category, which we had to call severe COVID because, of course, you can't change your outcomes once you start a trial. And so when we say that we had less, sorry, when we have more COVID in this symptomatic COVID, we're talking about um, the whole triangle. Can I go back? Yes, sorry, the whole triangle. Um, but when we talked about severe COVID, this is we were including all the people who were just sick for three days. And most of them were just the people who said they couldn't uh, work for three days. So it was really mild, moderate COVID. And we were not able to test the hypothesis that BCG could reduce severe disease. So many people say to me, aha, you showed it didn't work. But in fact, we showed it increased disease, which is what I expected, but we were not able to test severe COVID because with 10, nine hospitalizations and one death, you can say nothing, of course. People always say to me, where was the one death? Was it the BCG group or the, and I say, it doesn't matter because it has to be in one group. It was in the intervention group, which is good if you're the chief investigator. Um, so, Number one was the severe disease. Very important to understand that. The second one is the problem with sample size. So unfortunately, there was, sorry, fortunately, I should say, there was no COVID in Australia. Unfortunately, if you're running a trial. <laughs> um, and the second thing, of course, is the vaccines came along so much quicker. This was the projected timeline. The idea was to accelerate all of these phases and we could get a vaccine within 18 months by August 21. This would be some kind of miracle if we could do this. But what happened? It was December 2020 when we gave the first vaccine. I mean, it was unbelievably fast. I mean, unbelievably effective and unbelievably fast. It's fantastic that this happened. Can anybody remember who the first, the name of the person who got the first vaccine? It's an extra prize from Anna. She'll give you a free trip um, to um, Rio de Janeiro for the weekend. Is that okay? Well, who was the first person? The UK, yep. But it, it was a lady, an old lady. She had a name, though. The Queen. Here she is. It's a good trivial pursuit. Margaret Keenan. It's a good to have for general. There'll be lots of quizzes with this in the future, I think. Just 8th of December, Margaret Keenan. You have to remember this for later. Um, so, of course, not only were the vaccines came earlier, but healthcare workers, the very people we'd randomized, got them first. And so we had fewer participants. We stopped. We, were, we needed 10,000 was our sample size. So we had to stop recruiting. There were, of course, fewer COVID episodes and particularly fewer hospitalizations because the vaccines were so effective against hospitalization. So this was difficult for our trial. Now, if we look at the hazard ratio for COVID-19, all COVID, whether it's severe or not severe, it was 23% increase in the BCG group, but not statistically significant because the lower bounds of the 95% confidence interval are below one. Now, the elephant in the room um, is, did BCG vaccination is increase COVID-19? So Kamit and Gurren are worried about this. And the question is, is this a chance finding? Because it's not statistically significant. Or did we boost the immune response in those who were vaccinated? I think it's real. And the reason I think it's real is that type 2 error is very likely when you have an inadequate sample size. If you take 10 men and you take 10 women, the mean height is higher in the men than the women, but it's not statistically significant because you only had 10 and 10 women. That doesn't mean men and women on average are the same height. It just means your sample size was not big enough. So here is our every single time we looked at, however we looked, we always found more in the BCG group. We also know that BCG altered the immune response to BCG because we collected blood every three months and at baseline. We did lots of blood tests in everybody. We collected the bloods on the left and in a subset. We did very extensive testing, collected PBMCs, and we did whole blood stimulation assays and transcriptomics and epigenetics. We have 350,000 tubes that you're welcome to. We really want to share with people who would like to do research on COVID-19 um, or BCG. We've got lots of samples to share. And we've published this paper that showed in vitro that if you took blood from those who had BCG vaccine, 
those in vitro had a, a um, we changed their immune response to stimulation in the lab with SARS-CoV-2. So something happened to their immune response as well as what I think happened clinically. And this would not be unusual. In human challenge model that has been done in the Netherlands by Mihai Natia's group, they showed that when they did an experimental um, bites with mosquitoes, they showed that medical students who agreed to do this for a pizza, um, they had more symptoms in the group that got BCG. So very similar to what we found. Finally, um, there are some other protective effects, which I'll tell you about. So in summary, these are the things I want you to take home. The BRACE trial only looked at mild and moderate um, COVID. We were, had too few cases of hospitalizations and deaths to test whether we could prevent severe disease. These results tell you nothing about BCG and neonates. This is in adults. And BCG vaccine, the evidence is very strong for both the specific and the non-specific effects. So we should not take away from that. You've seen lots of some of the data, at least. And it only applies to SARS-CoV-2. So there are many other infections. And I showed you this paper before, but I cut the title. Because in this report, BCG prevented um, death from influenza A um, virus, but not from SARS-CoV-2 in the same animal model. There is something different about the pathogenesis, which won't surprise you. We know it's very different. It might be a respiratory virus, but it's very different to flu virus. So there may be different immune pathways. And finally, we were very interested. We looked at what other infections we could look at that are common. And the obvious one was herpes simplex. There are many retrospective studies, the blue showing protection against um, herpes simplex. And in our trial, we showed in the BRACE trial, this is unpublished data, please don't take this um, take text outside this room, that we showed we did reduce recurrence of herpes simplex oral um, lesions. So I'll skip there because we've really got to finish now. So that's the summary that there are other infections that we looked at that you're hearing about soon. So I just need to thank the people who kindly funded the study, including particularly the Gates Foundation, and I will leave for you there. There's lots, this is such a huge topic. You can appreciate it. And it's impossible in this time I've been given. But there's a chapter in the new Plotkin's vaccine that we've written that really has, the Plotkin's new textbook, that really goes through this in much more detail. You've had the short version. So I will end there. Questions? So, Thank you very much for a nice introduction to this field. So, so you mentioned yourself very briefly trained in immunity. So, um, what you believe in this, given that we also know that it's live BCG that probably circulates between half and a whole year in the body. And none of the preclinical studies that have been conducted have been looking beyond that time point. So, what you believe in trained in immunity versus live bacteria continuously stimulating immunity. Yes. And um, so the only thing I'll pick up in the question is the word belief. So we're not allowed to use the word belief. I don't have any beliefs. And that's one of the problems in this area is that people become really strongly believing that there's an effect or really strongly believing there isn't an effect. So what does the evidence show? Well, I'm glad you asked about trained immunity because just for those who've not come across this before, this is the concept that certain compounds, and particularly BCG, can alter the metabolic, can alter metabolic function, and this subsequently alters the epi epigenetics so that subsequent um, exposure to a pathogen in, in, um, leads to an, a boosted immune response through changes in the innate immune cells through hemopoiesis. So particularly NK cells and monocytes, et cetera. And there's good evidence for this in the paper that I would really draw your attention. This was the seminal paper where uh, Mihan Natia's group took um, blood from volunteers. And what they did was they took blood before BCG, two weeks after and three months after. And they looked at gamma interferon, TNF and IL-1 beta, so pro-inflammatory cytokine responses. And in vitro, when you stimulate people who've been given BCG, you would expect this increase in cytokines. And this is over a period, addressing a question of three months, so short-lived, absolutely short-lived, versus um, – but what was extraordinary in this paper was that they went on to look at what happens if you stimulated with things you wouldn't expect to have an effect from BCG. And they found the same phenomenon using Staph aureus and Candida albicans. And in, this is the paper that showed, the first paper that really showed those metabolic and epigenetic effects that underlie um, these, this phenomenon. So your question is, BCG undoubtedly induces trained immunity. I, I think nobody would disagree with that. And also it persists. It's a live vaccine. It's very different to most vaccines. You can culture it, as, as I think they're suggesting. And I think we simply don't know which of these effects is responsible for the clinical manifestations. And this is the problem with this field and why what we've been doing very heavily in both our randomized trial in 
neonates and in adults is collecting samples which we can then correlate with the clinical effects and look at those who um, respond and those who don't to try and understand which of these mechanisms underlie. And there's other proposed bystander T cell effects, etc. May, may I just comment that I also think that's another important thing is PCG is the, truly the only effect, uh, OKV also, but, but these two live vaccines are the, truly right now the only effective vaccines given at birth. Um, yes. Yes. And and uh, and there are mechanisms of actions that we need to know to understand there in order to actually understand whether that is also one of the reasons why BCG is so good at having these secondary effects. Yes, these undoubtedly the, the manifestations are better when it's given at birth. We've got a PhD student who's comparing the bloods taken from the neonates and the adults asking that question. We'll be there. Hi, Nigel. Thanks for a lovely talk, as always. Um, I know I'm not allowed to say this, but I'm a believer. So declaring my my conflict of interest. Um, my question relates to the cost effectiveness um, analyses that are done for policymakers. Generally, non-specific effects are not included in those considerations. And I wonder whether you've thought about this and whether you think we need to be a little bit more broad with what's included because these non-specific effects may make a vaccine that's considered not cost effective in particular settings to be actually cost effective if they're included. So have you had any thoughts about yes, this? Absolutely. I strongly agree with that. And we've had lots of discussions with various people at WHO to make that point. And I think people are thinking of BCG as more than just a TB vaccine. So you're absolutely right. Also, it's not just the cost effectiveness. It's if a country has declining TB rates, but still has high mortality from other infections. If you take away BCG because you think there's no more problem with TB, you might lose that beneficial effect against the other infections. Thank you, Nigel. Esther, I want to find out about um, your thoughts about the age to give TB vaccine, the BCG vaccine, especially in TB endemic uh, countries, because um, I've worked in different settings and different countries have different guidelines on what well, I, age. I agree very them. strongly with the WHO recommendation that it should be given as soon as possible after birth, straight away. Now, that's the recommendation, but the data shows that's not what happens because many babies are born in outside healthcare facilities or where there isn't BCG. And they're often the first contact with the healthcare facility is at six weeks for their other vaccines. And a lot of babies get it then, but they've lost that benefit, particularly during the neonatal period. So you must give it at birth um, to have the, the most benefit of the off-target effects will be during those first four or six weeks when you're still, as you know, neonatal mortality hasn't declined as much as infant mortality. So I strongly recommend, agree with the WHO recommendation, first 24 hours straight after birth. The last thing, is off-target the same as indirect? Um, no, different. I would see that as different, as I said at the beginning. I can't as if so. The nomenclature is quite tricky, but I would think off-target, non-specific, are the two really or heterologous. Heterologous. Thank you so much for that talk, um, Catherine. I um, I'm interested in that issue of delayed vaccination when it comes to DTP and measles, and if in children who maybe have missed their DTP three and end up getting DTP and measles at the same time at that nine month period, is there a sort of negation of both effects when you have yes. a live in a... So the scheduling is the one where you could alter these effects. And we've got a trial um, that's based in Switzerland at the moment where we're bringing back the measles vaccine to reduce that time where they just exposed last vaccine non-live to six months and then comparing that in a randomised way to looking at the six to nine month. The data suggests there's tables in that Higgins paper in the BMJ that suggest if you give them together, you don't lose as much effect as if you have the non-live vaccine after the live vaccine. So best scenario is last vaccine live. Second best is to have the live and the non-live together. That's what the epidemiological data suggests. Thank you, I'm Santosh with the WHO. So just wanted to ask if there's any, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's <laughs> right. so I'm with the WHO. I just wanted to ask if this has any modifications with the scientific brief that WHO pro published in April 2022, the outcome of uh, the findings here. And back then, I understood that discussions, there were two clinical trials that were underway for being evaluation, right? So is this uh, what you presented? I think it's just one. So just So are you talking about the BCG COVID trials? Or? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, there are other trials published now. Um, Almost as if you asked me. 
you didn't ask me about the strain though. That, that I can try to predict the questions. It's kind of fun. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Oh, it's not a good way to do it, is it? So there, there, these are all the trials that were registered. Um, that was R1. And these are the trials that have all reported now. And the problem is, as this illustrates, it's a complicated graphic, but what it's showing you in different colors is that people have used different strains. The length shows you different follow-ups and the little icons, different outcomes and different definitions for outcomes. And so they're all very difficult um, to compare. But what I can tell you is that overall, the pattern is very similar. And um, there are some trials that show BCG was beneficial against COVID, some that show no effects, and some show a slightly non-statistical increase. And the problem is that there, many of them didn't have complete follow-up. And so I, I, um, I think ours would be one of the most sound that you could rely on, I guess, is a nice way to put it. So th th there are a few reports now. Oh, thank you, Ms. Sophia. Um, I'm interested in, um, are there any ecological studies um, studying the impact of BCG on allergies, like comparing BCG cohort? Uh, yes, there's um, a few meta-analyses now, and they, they're all from observational studies. This is the problem, and so they're subject to bias. But there are, um, and they show different things. Overall, there are more studies that show a beneficial effect against asthma and allergies, but there are, I can, and it's one of those things you can cherry pick the trials you want to make the point that it either does or doesn't have an effect. In our trials in Melbourne, we showed a profound effect on eczema, but we found very little effect on food allergy. And um, on when we're just analyzing now the effect on asthma, so by next year I'll be able to tell you what happened to eczema in our six year olds who were in the trial six years ago. Lou hasn't been called on before. Sarah, go ahead. Hi, I'm Sarah from the U.S. I'm just wondering, are there any data from countries that are using Hep B as a birth dose, either alone or in conjunction with others? And what do we know about, and I know it's not a live vaccine, but is there any data one way or the other on That's that? Very good question, because lots of babies get BCG and Hep B together, and they may get them in either sequence and with a varying delay. So as part of our before this trial that I explained, in our trials in neonates, we had exactly this problem, that hepatitis B at birth was a confounder. And so we did a separate small trial um, where we gave either BCG or Hep B at birth, or both, or neither. And then one week later, they gave, we gave them the one that they didn't have. Um, one week later, I think it was one month, I can't remember. But we gave them so they ended up with everything. And we compared across, and we were unable to show that the hepatitis B was interfering with the BCG response. But it's a good question. It's one of the one of the many problems of doing BCG trials is the HEP potential confounder of a non-life vaccine at birth. Questions are there. So I'm Anna from the Netherlands. I actually participated in the BCG Corona oh, study. We didn't miss your we didn't miss oh you'll miss one, yeah. 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 <laughs> but um I have another question on the, the effect in neonates. Could it be a relative effect because their adaptive immunity is not at steam yet or um, well, of course, we like to think that the neonatal immune system is, um, we talked about it being immature, but actually it's deliberately set to be appropriate for neonates. So I suppose they're particularly vulnerable and the relatively trained immunity might be more important or the innate immunity might be more important. That's what you're suggesting. I think that's quite possible. Yes. I mean, as I said, the most profound effects have certainly been shown in neonates. And whether that's because of what you've suggested or whether it's like, in the developing immune system, there's more um, plasticity, that there's more ability to change the trajectory of the immune system. The whole kind of hygiene hypothesis that BCG is a safe way of exposing the immune system to a bacteria, a good big dose of, as you were saying before, behind of replicating bacteria. Because, of course, we're meant to be born. The design is that you're meant to be exposed to lots of bacteria at birth to get your immune. I mean, we now no longer do that, which is a good thing because more babies survive, but they have a different immune trajectory and maybe we're resetting that with bcg one more please thank you i have a question about vaccines in development so if this if, if impact of bcg on neonatal mortality is true what impact does that have on the type on how, how we conduct trials for you know tb vaccines in development is there any particular data that we should be looking out for so when it comes to policy decision we don't have a full data package to be able to answer a question of whether we need BCG or whether we need a new vaccine. Yeah. What, 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 how does how does that impact the development of TB vaccines? 
I know I've been saying every time there's a great question, but they genuinely are. That is a superb question. I feel like I asked you to ask me this. Um, I think this is really important. When we test a new vaccine, we test for the target disease, right? We don't look at all cause mortality, which is really what matters. And so I think it's very important. Many of us have been advocating that we don't just look at um, the target disease. And that was quite controversial with the RTSS vaccine, for example. There's a whole literature on the discussion around that, on all cause mortality versus the target disease. So I think that's very important. And particularly with the new TB vaccines, there's a whole bunch of vaccines in development that are designed to eventually replace BCG. And that would be a very bad thing. As I said before, we might reduce tuberculosis deaths, but increase all-cause mortality if it doesn't have these off-target effects. So critically important, and particularly with birth dose of any new TB vaccine. So that is a great place to end. Thank you.